Greetings, everyone. It is Gleecon back again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Back after having survived a walk near half a continent in uh, World of Warcraft Classic. On our last episode, that's what we did. We took Kelly and um, we decided her next zone is going to be Stone Talon Mountains. For better or worse, we're going to take some cross fingers and see how well we can survive on that side of the world. Um, so she uh, was in Westfall, went then to Stormwind, a portal from a nice fellow player, took us over to Darnassus where we then traveled down. We flew, took a boat over to the mainland, then went down through Darkshore, then through Ashenvale, and wound up in Stone Talon proper. Um, it was a... It, all of that journey took a long enough time that there was no time for actual questing. We've also been reading the Dungeons and Dragons uh, role-playing source books, and we're reading the Alliance Player's Guide. We've hit chapter six, which is the most lore-heavy chapter. On our last one, we read a little bit about half-elf culture, and we've read about the different elven cultures. So stay a while, and listen, as we continue to jump into human history. This is another one of the major races. So this one's probably gonna be about as long as the one that we did on the Night Elves. Here we go with human history. Most folks know now know about the earliest parts of known human history, all that Arathator, Arathor stuff and the Seven Kingdoms. But it's also important to know what happened between the first war with the Orcs and the present day. To shape our modern era. I feel like the Arathor stuff's more interesting. We've done less on that. A few words on the stuff between the earliest human days and the first war, though. The main piece of information to know is that humans got their magic from the High Elves, stomped the trolls, good, one of the better moves in human history, and proceeded to use magic to do pretty much whatever they felt like. After beginning to use arcane magic, the humans noticed that demons were showing up on Azeroth, so the humans quietly went to the High Elves and told them what was happening. The High Elves told the humans about how the use of arcane magic attracted the Burning Legion's attention long ago. Obviously, the Burning Legion was still drawn to arcane magic, so the High Elves explained that as long as humans continued to use arcane magic, demons would keep showing up. The humans and High Elves then agreed to create the Guardian of Tarisful to fight against the demons that were inevitably going to show up. Eventually, one of these guardians named Egwin was real powerful. She blew the pants off a few demons in Northrend and helped out the dragons up there. Now that's all well and good. Getting dragons on your side is a very sound idea. The bad idea was trying to take on an avatar of Sargeras, the Lord of the Burning Legion himself. Some people think that it was the real Sargeras, but I'm pretty confident he's never actually set foot on Azeroth. Whoops. Well, she destroyed this avatar with a single spell, or so she thought. In reality, Sargeras just implanted himself inside her womb, ensuring that the next guardian would contain his demonic essence. Egwin is about as stable as a goblin landmine from this point on. She does her own thing for a while and eventually finds herself a nice one-night stand with an archmage of the Kirin Tor. Humans. <laughs> anyway, she gets pregnant intentionally since she doesn't want to pass on her superpowers to one of her other terrestrial people. And having a kid gave her a loophole of sorts. Big mistake. The first war was the beginning of a turning point in human history. During that time, humans were the dominant force in the Eastern Kingdoms, if only due to sheer numbers. Stormwind in the south and Lordaeron in the north were great sources of pride, and it wasn't until Stormwind fell to the Orc invaders that they realized how great a threat the Horde posed to human civilization. One important note is that it was ultimately a human or a demon, if you prefer, not an Orc, who started the First War. Medivh, son of Egwin, and the last of the Guardians of Tarisul, was born with a fragment of the soul of Sargeras, Lord of the Burning Legion, within him. Though Medivh was a strong-willed lad, and the power of the Guardian flowed through his veins, he could not resist the will of Sargeras. On his fourteenth birthday, he fell into a deep coma. His friends brought him to North Cherabi in the Elwyn Forest, where he rested for many years struggling against the demonic presence inside him. When he woke up, Sargeras was dominant. 
Medivh had moments where he acted of his own will, but he was no longer the same man he had once been. Medivh was the one who contacted the orcs and lured them into sacking Azeroth, as well as the one who sowed the seeds for the assassination of his former best friend, King Lane of Stormwind. Lothar, the most effective general against the orcs, was busy confronting the demon-possessed Medivh when the orcs began to press their attack. In time, Stormwind fell to the invading orcs and the humans suffered their first devastating defeat. Sir Anduin Lothar led the survivors from Stormwind north, and he became the first leader of the Alliance. The orcs followed Lothar's retreating boats, and the second war began as elves and dwarves raised their swords against the Horde for the first time. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was King Lane Rin that was technically the first leader of the Alliance. And it is... Um, Lothar is not technically the leader in the Second War. Um, it is whatever the Arthas Minithil's dad's name is. Humans founded the Alliance primarily out of fear for their own lands, but their reasoning was understandable enough. United, the humans, elves, gnomes, and dwarves were much more capable of fighting off the orc onslaught. All was not well with the Alliance, however, even at this time. The self-righteous bastards in Gilneas refused to send more than token aid, resolving to confront the orcs on their own. They remain isolationists to this day, or up until classic, actually up until the uh, cataclysm. The Grey Main Wall separates their own little peninsula from the rest of Lordaeron. Uh, this is a picture of Aegwyn fighting the Avatar of Sargeras. The situation in Alterac was far more dire, however. Lord Aiden Perinold and the rest of the ruling families of Alterac secretly sided with the orcs in exchange for power. I'm glad we found the bastards out before things got real ugly, but nevertheless many good men were lost to their initial deception. King Terranish should have put them all to the sword, I say. That bastard Perinold's son, Aladdin, is still around and leads the Syndicate, a bunch of crazies who are still trying to take over Lordaeron for their own purposes to this day. And I believe there are like there's like a very small handful of quests you can do involving the syndicate. We haven't done any yet in classic, but I think it comes with an associated reputation that you can um, try to get exalted in. About this time, Sir Uther Lightbringer, another righteous human lad, becomes the first knight of the Silver Hand or Paladin, as those of us who don't need unnecessarily fancy titles call it. These knights were a terrific aid in the war, skilled in combat, riding, and even doing a bit of healing here and there. Except those damn retribution paladins. Most of them can't heal worth a damn. Bah. We got damn them twice in the same sentence. I gotta say, they made some tweaks to the rat pallies recently in uh, retail, and I feel like that's a pretty powerful spec. Although Erator on Classic for me as a rat pally, I feel like he's, it might be his lack of a weapon, but He's terrible. <laughs> Fortunately, Sir Lothar was able to drive the Horde back to Blackrock Spire, which served as their primary base of operations. Here, he was ambushed by the forces of Orgrim Doomhammer. I've heard talk of Lothar losing to Doomhammer in single combat, and I don't believe a word of it. Lothar's sword would have rightly made mincemeat out of a Doomhammer like, like it did to everything else. Lothar was a good man. One of the best leaders I've ever had the pleasure of working with. He will be missed. Let's take a, a side story here. Is she? Akalon said haughtily. Pay attention when I'm talking to you. The mage turned his gaze away from the demons amassed in front of him, refocusing on his unlikely companion. He despised working with warlocks, but thus far, Akalon's information had proved accurate. And he knew how much his order would benefit if the demon summoner's tales were true. He was unlikely to ever trust Akalon completely, for now he would pay the warlocks but for now he would pay the warlock's words heed. Especially in such a dangerous place as this one. Wait here, mortal, and remain hidden. I will use my powers to gain control over one of the dreadlords below, and use him to convince the other demons that we are guests of Lord Kazak. We are fortunate that the massive Doom God is still preoccupied with his business in winter spring. Aklon gave a small snort, perhaps disgust at him, or the demon's issue was uncertain, and then repeated, Wait here, once more before disappearing over the ridge. Ishi took the moment to consider their objective. 
even without Kazakh's protection, the, the Amber Seal Keeper would be difficult, if not impossible, for only two spellcasters to access. While he was perhaps powerful enough to defeat a Doomguard or a Dreadlord in combat, an entire army garrisoned the valley below. They were the survivors of Mount Hygel, and thereby some of the Legion's best. How does Akalon plan to take the staff and get out alive, he wondered. He doubted that his companion was powerful enough to take over a Dreadlord's mind for a short time, but even if that were true, he could not think of a way they could actually reach the staff and retrieve it. A demon slave might grant them access to the scar, but certainly not the Amber Seal Keeper itself, which was no doubt heavily protected. The mage's thoughts were interrupted as Akalon returned, a massive demon trailing him. She instinctively began the gestures and incantations, but Akalon gestured for him to be silent, halting his preparations. He is mine, for now, the warlock explained. The dreadlord twitched noticeably and grimaced, clearly pained, but Akalon only smiled. This way now, good mage. And I guess that's maybe that picture. It looks like we have a party of five at the top looking over a battle between some orcs and humans. Like, that might be a recap of the end of the Second War. The orcs made a huge mistake in killing Lothar. Most soldiers loved Lothar like their own father, and his death drove us to new heights of desperation. Taralyon, Lothar's lieutenant, succeeded where no other had. He led the alliance to victory at Blackrock Spire. Khadgar, Medivh's only surviving apprentice, summoned an ancient spell of unrivaled power and incinerated the Dark Portal. I still remember watching the sky ignite with arcane fire as he called down a pillar of light upon the stone alcove of the portal. This marked the end of the Second War, at least for those of us who remain on Azeroth soil. The orcs then reconstructed the Dark Portal, and Turalyon and Khadgar gathered some of the greatest warriors of the Alliance and followed the Horde to Draenor as they retreated through it. Though the Draenor expedition was successful in that the majority of the orcs were forced to retreat, the heroes of that battle were lost to us. Many whisper that Khadgar and his allies survived and were forced to retreat into a portal to another world, but we have no real evidence either way. The humans lost a massive number of their own troops on Draenor, including some very important figures such as Danath of Stromgard. Many of the refugees in Arathi claimed that if Danath were still around, they would have no difficulty in reclaiming Stromgard and then turning their attention toward helping the rest of the Alliance. The lad was good with a blade, I'll give him that. I was half tempted to go along to Draenor, but my lord and king wisely suggested I remain at home. Good call, brother, but I'm still disappointed I haven't had a chance to see Draenor yet. I hear it's red. Very red. Blood red. Sounds interesting, eh, Magni? Maybe after I finish this book? In spite of the loss of many veterans, humans prospered in the aftermath of the Second War. The great city of Stormwind slowly began to rebuild, and the remaining orcs were captured and rounded up into internment camps. A few orcs, notably the mighty Grom Hellscream, managed to evade capture. Also, the former warchief Doomhammer escaped his imprisonment, but in general, resistance was low. The orcs lost their will to fight, and withdrawal from their race-wide addiction to demonic magic made them sink into a pathetic state. It was around this time that a human wizard named Ronin, aided by several other adventurers and the mighty red dragon Coriolstraws, freed Alex Straws of the Dragon Queen from captivity at the hands of the orcs. This event was important in and of itself, but it also made the red dragon flight look favorably on the humans, which was apparently a source of some debate before. Hopefully those dragons will come out from wherever they're hiding soon enough and help us with the blasted scourge. If they don't, I'll be damned if the undead aren't knocking on the doors of Grim Batal soon enough. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The scourge. Damn bloody scourge. So the arc super badass demon Lord killed Jaden takes a powerful orc shaman and puts him in a block of ice. Now that may sound pretty good to you, but here's the snag. He gave the orc sickle superpowers too, like raising the dead and lots of them. So this new Lich King finds a powerful human arc mage named Kel'Thuzad and convinces the bright fellow that it would be a swell idea to kill pretty much the whole damn world and turn them into mindless piles of rotting flesh. Kel'Thuzad thinks this is a great idea, presumably because he isn't getting any attention from the ladies beforehand. I have to speculate a bit here and forms the Cult of the Damned, a group of the most powerful, crazy, idiotic humans who have ever walked the face of our planet. Oh, they're power crazy. Good stuff. Well, good old Uther didn't like the idea of all his people being turned into zombies. 
He and the other knights of the Silver Hand went up and tried to heal the sick, but it didn't work out too well. I hear horror stories of diseased victims actually being burned by the holy light when the paladins tried to heal them. Terrible. At any rate, the paladins were well protected from the plague with their holy abilities, but they couldn't do much to help. I hear a few people may have been actually cured by the knights, but their help was too little too late. I'm sure most of you have heard about what's happened since then. Arthas, one of Uther's knights, oh, and the prince of Lordaeron, too, went completely out of his gourd. He ended up leading many of his people on a suicide mission to Northrend before joining the Scourge himself. Many good men and women were lost because of Arthas' foolishness. Let that be a lesson to the lot of you. Arthas came home leading the Scourge, killed the rightful king, his own father, and stole the throne. Uther fought Arthas, but the Death Knight proved stronger, and Uther, too, fell before the traitor's blade. Arthas converted Sylvanas Windrunner, Ranger General of Silvermoon, into a banshee during his assault on Quel'Thalas, and that decision, decision bit him in the ass. When the Lich King was losing his power, many undead slipped free of his control, and Sylvanas betrayed Arthas and the Lich King to create her own faction of undead, the Forsaken. The Forsaken were all former human and elves who willingly served Sylvanas. The Forsaken allied with the humans for a brief time, which ended when Sylvanas murdered Grand Marshal Garethos. Good riddance, you dwarf-hating bastard. Now there are only a few pockets of living humans in Lordaeron. Stromgard is falling to the Syndicate, Par Paranold's traitorous fools, while the rest of the continent is under siege by two different groups of undead. Stormwind is rebuilding in the south, but the humans there are not all happy. Many claim they were not properly paid for the repairs on Stormwind. A former leader of the Stonecutters there created the Deafiest Brotherhood to look for revenge, as we've been kind of hinting at with our quests in Classic. These thieves need to get their damn priorities straight and worry about the bigger threats like the undead in Duskwood, which will quickly spread and overwhelm everything in the area, including these rogues, if someone can't find the source. I'm going to guess the reason the undead are present that far south has something to do with Karazhan, but it's hard to say. All in all, the once mighty nations of the humans are in terrible shape right now. Stormwind is the only major city still standing in the Eastern Kingdoms, although Dalaran does have a pretty glowy sphere thing around its ruins. Good work, Magi. You're doing a damn fine job of making a pile of rocks invulnerable. There are almost as many undead humans as living ones, and the ratio gets worse with each passing day. Okay, so we're going to move on to the culture now. Hey, I, I feel like almost the need to put a parental guidance warning on this episode. They're, the, they're cursing so much in the... Um, the writing here. Human culture. Human culture is very interesting right now because the previous boundaries of ranks and professions are gradually beginning to break down due to desperation. Since the foundation of the Empire of Arathor, the concept of nobility has been extremely important in human society. Only now, with more and more people realizing that your title can't stop a sword or a plague, are humans beginning to treat each other more and more as equals. Is this not to say that nobility has no significance in contemporary human culture? For example, king, well, prince, really, Anduin, makes significant military decisions not because of his leadership abilities, but rather because he's the son of the previous king, and he has authority due to birthright. This is something of an extreme example, but nobles still hold a marginal amount of influence. In fact, most of the boy king's advisors are qualified because they came from a noble line. I'll get to my gripes about this sort of thing in the section on the state of the Alliance, and believe me, you'll hear a good word or two from me on the subject. Each of the seven major human cities had different traditions, and Stormwind has become a melting pot of these ideas and customs due to the sheer number of refugees from every part of the globe who have traveled there for safe haven. Theramore is even more interesting because they have a good lot of dwarves and elves too, so they come up with some crazy stuff. As communities, they were... Cr created through the cooperation of multiple races, both New Stormwind and Theramore adapt sometimes in unusual ways. For example, when I was in Theramore, I noticed a good number of humans and dwarves joining the Night Elves in a brief prayer or visit to a moon well at moonrise. On an interesting note, humans seem to naturally mediate between the different races and organize activities that may suit them all. In Theramore, you'll see both High Elves, albeit very few of them, and Night Elves, which is pretty strange considering they haven't been on speaking terms and Oh, 10,000 years or so? Humans made that possible. They're masters of diplomacy, which is both intriguing and annoying at the same time. There are both humans who use this to make everyone live happily ever after, such as Jana Proudmore, and those who use their political skills to turn people against each other, like Aiden Perinold. Consequently, this is probably why former humans lead most of the Scourge. 
And yeah, I know the Lich King is both an orc and a human now, but that's just too much to think about. While humans pride themselves on taking leadership roles, there's been a recent decline in act active human leaders, with a few exceptions, such as Lady Jaina Proudmoore. Likewise, the typical roles of humans from specific cities hold less weight. For example, ten years back, nearly every man, woman, or child from Dalaran was a mage. Okay, bad example. They're still pretty much the same. Down in Stormwind, though, families that have been have bred and raised soldiers for generations are learning new trades, and nobles are mingling with the common people more and more. In the past, there was almost as much of a distinction between humans from two different cities as there was between High Elves and Night Elves, or even High Elves and humans. That doesn't seem to be the case as much anymore. The Second War brought the races closer together than ever before. Nevertheless, humans are still a race of extremes, and this is obvious when we come to the topic of religion. Humans were the first known followers of the Holy Light, and remain its primary followers. Though faith had waned somewhat during the Third War with the inability of the Silver Hand to cure the Scourge, organizations like the Scarlet Crusade have managed to regain the faith of the people for better or worse. The Holy Light plays a major part in human culture. Even those who don't believe in it pay the light lip service. I've heard for the light shouted more times on the battlefield than I care to count. Hell, even warlocks spend a good deal of time cursing the light, so I guess they consider it worth their attention. You don't see as many children pretending to be knights of the Silver Hand these days, but it's still not uncommon. I've thankfully never seen a child pretending to be a priest of the Church of the Light. That would just be odd, but their numbers aren't doing so bad these days either. Religious debate has been a tremendous issue in recent years, however, with the most official religious documents destroyed or lost along with Lord Ron. I figure the lost tome of divinity, divinity that Andu and Lothar rescued from the dead mines back in the First War is still around, but surprisingly I haven't heard much about it lately. The end result is a lot of humans yelling at each other over slight variations on how to think about some abstract concept. Fun stuff. The young knights and priests tend to see the loss of old texts as a chance to start anew and rebuild a stronger church. Obviously, traditionalists don't care for that idea at all that much. The development of new religious orders, which may or may not have been sanctioned by the archbishop, is the source of a good deal of debate, too. Some have gone as far as to call groups such as the Argent Dawn heretics or cultists. I have to wonder how much of that is a difference in beliefs and how much is just plain jealousy. That's another thing to touch on. Crazy cultists. Humans seem to breed tons of them these days. The Cult of the Damned and whatever the demon worshippers feel like calling themselves are the best examples, but the Scarlet certainly fall into that category too. It seems like if a human finds something to devote herself to, she follows it with great enthusiasm no matter how insane it might be. Consequently, there's a terrific stigma against all these cults, with the possible exception of the Scarlet Crusade, who are generally tolerated out of ignorance in civilized society. Human nations tear themselves apart as so-called religious individuals go on with hunts for the followers of the demons and undead. Consequently, humans make up a good number of the Twilight's Hammer, followers of the old gods, but most people have never heard of them. Yet I'll wager that if this dwarf's intuition is still any good, we'll be hearing more about or from those old gods soon. That sounds like a whole lot of fun now, don't it? Religion isn't the only thing humans are crazy enough to devote their entire lives to. Guild members and simple trade practitioners often focus on the perfection of a single skill, which is not unusual, but humans seem to be the most willing to market their skills, whatever they may be. While a dwarf may be proud of being the latest in a long family line of smiths or skilled engineers, humans have the same with a bit more variety and organization. They have guilds for everything. Hell, even the thieves have a union of sorts. S if, FI if SI7, the Stormwind Intelligence Agency, <laughs> can be called that. Consequently, members of these trade guilds get pretty wealthy if they're good at what they do. This makes up a distinct middle class between the peasants and nobility, which isn't found in all of Azeroth's cultures. This is something of an issue because many noble families see the growing influence of commoners as a problem. These wealthy are not so wealthy because the nobles aren't paying them what they should. Merchants show open resentment for the nobles in turn. The best example of the situation is the Defius Brotherhood, which I've already mentioned. Problems started out with stonemasons who weren't properly paid for their repairs on Stormwind, and it's turning into a full-scale rebellion with the help of mysterious allies. Since there's never been anything formal to give middle-class people greater rights than the peasantry, at least to my knowledge, I can see the problems with groups like this only growing more common in time. I expect to see other smaller thieves' brotherhoods trying to mimic the success of the Defius soon enough. 
Another thing to consider is that the poorest of people support groups like the Defius as well, in many cases, due to misguided notions about being robbed by the nobility or a number of other reasons. Much of this is probably due to a lack of proper communication from Stormwind's government, or unusual strategies such as erecting military buildings such as guard towers near a farm, and potentially destroying said farm's productivity. I don't know what we have here. It looks like uh, two people have murdered one another, or what this guy has murdered someone, and I see like a demon trapped in a gem or something. Maybe maybe that's a Twilight Hammer person, but it also looks kind of like an orc, so it might be the Searing Blade. I'm saying a lot about thieves and knights here, but humans seem to have a hand in damn near everything. Perhaps it's their curiosity, but you'll see humans of nearly every profession. They quickly pick up bits of culture, language, and other traits from the people they spend time with, almost as quickly as I do, in fact. For example, down in the Stranglethorn Vale, you'll notice a lot of humans who have learned to hunt effectively with a dwarven rifle. In some cases, with minimal training from a real rifleman, read dwarf. In minimal training from, uh, I mean, in more ancient times, humans also picked up magic from the elves right quick, and well, they whoop some trolls good, and I'm all for that. Mage, I get obsessed with their craft just like every human does. There's a lot more to human culture than just blasting and swinging, but most of it's more boring. Holiday assimilation is important. They celebrate anything that anyone else does. For example, we dwarves have a winter festival where we tell stories about Great Father Winter. In recent years, more and more humans have been participating in this event. Likewise, they've joined us in honoring the veterans of war in recent harvest festivals each year. In specific, many pay tribute to Uther the Lightbringer, who is considered among the foremost of human heroes. The humans of Lordaeron used to have a festival near the end of harvest, the Forsaken have bastardized this practice, and now use the evening for their mysterious Wicker Man rituals. I intend to observe it this year and record what I can, since I know little about this strange event. Ah, hero worship. One of these days, those silly lads in Stormwind will be making statues of the three Bronzebeard brothers. I'm knowing it. Human architecture is generally simpler than that of the dwarves, which is understandable since they built their cities completely outside. I can't fathom why. That being said, they make some of the best damn statues this dwarf has ever seen. I'm thinking of the ones outside Stormwind, pretty much. Mage towers are fairly impressive in their own right, but most of the magi cheat and use their spells to make parts of them anyway, so that doesn't count. So modern human architecture is a blend of dwarven and high elven designs, which isn't surprising. This is especially true in Lordaeron, where even the secluded elves of Quell'th the Lost would often make appearances to trade. Likewise, most objects they craft are in between the lightweight style of the elves and the solid stone style we prefer. Due to their political leanings, design style, and the like, I like to think of humans as a middle race. They serve as go-betweens, and most of their crafts and technology are intermediate as well. I'm losing track of my topic again, though. I wanted to discuss heroes. Anduin Lothar... Uther the Lightbringer, Medivh, these are names of legend, and not just among the humans. Now, admittedly, these lads all played a big role in the First, Second, and Third Wars, but so did the likes of Magni Bronzebeard and numerous others. Humans get noticed. Humans get praised. Humans have a strong, folklorish nature that glorifies their own people more and more with each passing year. Perhaps that's why so many followed the famous Admiral Dalin Proudmoore, when it was clear he had a few screws loose in hell, even after his daughter declared her opposition. I have to be clear that this isn't just because of the human leadership thingy. Even humans who haven't played a major role in things tend to be written down in their history books more frequently and favorably than members of other races. The fact is, humans are just good at finding someone they think is impressive and making the whole rest of the world feel the same way, regardless of if they're right in the head or not. I'm not complaining, mind you, it's just worth noting. That I saw a lot of unsung heroes on the battlefields of the Second and Third War, and a disproportionate number of humans being noticed and promoted. Interesting. Well, I'm getting into Alliance Chain of Command stuff and other fun now. I'm itching to write a whole section on that, so I'll take a breather here and get back to this soon enough. Alright, and we'll wrap with some human knowledge. What the character knows about it, as we've already discussed, depends on their knowledge checks, which can be performed below. So, basically anyone not living under a rock with the tiniest shred of, of local knowledge knows that the average human lifespan is shorter than like other races like dwarves and elves. Uh, you're considered old by 60. Um, and most people with local knowledge or any knowledge of religion and pretty much all heroes know that the majority of humans follow the holy light with varying levels of reverence. Um, so a decent chunk of people with knowledge of local 
um, affairs or knowledge of nobility and royalty. And like half of heroes know that there's no single leader that rules all human society. Rather, specific kingdoms have monarchs who often hold conflicting views. Currently, Jaina Proudmoore is running things in Theramore, for example. Now, no regular people, but like knowledge specialists, scholars of the Arcana or local knowledge masters, know that Dalaran is considered one of the human nations, but the Kirin Tor, who serve as the city's inner, inner council, are not all human. They've been a, there have been a number of elves on their council, but it's widely believed Magi of other races may be a part of their council as well, perhaps even to this day. Dalaran is currently sealed behind a mysterious barrier, barrier of nearly impenetrable energy. Okay, that same level of local of local or nobility and royalty knowledge will let you know that the human king in Stormwind is a child and is likely being manipulated by his so-called mentors. And finally, only the most OG historian or um, nobility and royalty inner circle person knows that human kingdoms were nearly united several years ago by a noble from the once proud Altrac lord uh, named Lord Davil Prester. He was set to be married to Princess Callia Menethil, our girl Callie of Lordaeron, but disappeared under unusual circumstances. That's because it was really Deathwing. Rumors indicate he may not have been who he claimed and that the nobles of Lordaeron may have even been under his control for a time. And they were, yeah, so very few people know the inklings of the story. But guess what? Watchers of lore of Warcraft, my lore master, we would pass that DC 30 knowledge check because we are those OG lore masters by taking this journey. I was rereading some, I was looking through comments the other day and one one person made a comment that this channel is like a library of Alexandria for Lorecraft lore, Warcraft lore. I don't know that we're there yet, but I love the sentiment and we will get there. Everything will be in there eventually. Thank you everyone. We got another episode in the pipe, five by five. You know, as always, I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.